Rerun is an open source SDK and viewer for visualizing and interacting with multimodal data streams. The SDK lets you send data from anywhere, and the viewer collects the data and aligns it so the user can scroll back and forth in time to interpret it. The tools have been applied in spatial computing, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Emil Ernerfeldt is the co-founder and CTO of Rerun. Emil is also the creator of eGUI, which is a popular GUI library written in Rust. He joins the podcast to talk about his history in game development, building super fast tools, and developing Rerun. Gregor Vand is a security-focused technologist and is the founder and CTO of MailPass. Previously, Gregor was a CTO across cybersecurity, cyber insurance, and general software engineering companies. He has been based in Asia Pacific for almost a decade and can be found via his profile at vand.hk. Hi, Emil. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, Emil, thanks for coming on today. We're going to dive into Rerun, which is what this episode is all about. But to begin with, I would love to hear more about your journey to this kind of point in time. You know, we do quite a bit of research here on the podcast before we go into episodes. And I, I think you've got quite an interesting one. I'm already going to put it out there. I believe, you know, you have worked on a remake of the 1985 arcade classic Gauntlet, which I'm sure a few of our listeners can definitely think about. So with that in mind, yeah, can you sort of take us through your story before co-founding Rerun? Sure. I'm from Stockholm, Sweden, and I kind of fell in love with programming when I was about 15. I had a programming course in high school, and I right away I like wanted to program visual things, visual interactive things, mostly games. Like that's what I thought was really fun. Like you, you can build these things using basically mathematics that just come alive. I thought that was magical. So after studying computing science for a few years, I got a job doing a 2D physics sandbox of all things sold for education, which was a really fun thing as well to work on because you know, it was a little program where you can like, you can draw a car with your mouse and then that car would just come to life right away which is, that was a really fun thing to do. But I moved around to various different things because I, you know, I love learning new things. So after that, I went to Arrowhead Game Studios, which at the time was, yes, building a remake of the 1985 Gauntlet. Arrowhead is more famous, I think, for Helldivers, which is very big right now. But yeah, back then there were like two teams there of 10 people each. So it's a very small team building this game. And it's, it was a really fun, creative environment to work in. And I know as, as one of the few programmers on the team, we were three programmers. I also found like a niche building like dev tools and the visualization tools a little bit. And I, I found that that's something I really like doing as well. Like if I would look over the shoulder of an artist and see that their tools are bad, that hurts me. And I feel like as programmers, we have kind of a responsibility to improve things when we can, because we kind of have the power to build these better tools. But yeah, that development of that game was a little bit stressful, I would say. So after finishing it, I left for another company called Volumental. They were working with 3D scanning. So they had got their hands on these like Kinect depth cameras. It was from Xbox, if you remember back in those days, this would have been in 2015, around that time. And we're trying to build like a company around 3D scanning. And that's where I met my now co-founders, Nico and Moritz. And I didn't know anything about computer vision or 3D scanning or anything. So I had to learn basically everything from scratch. And again, I found myself like I need to visualize things because when I came in, everything was written in Python. And we had basically these scans that were in file format. And then you run some Python script on it and it will output some numbers. And you want to change the Python code to make those numbers go down. And I like, this is too abstract. Like this is not, not doing anything for me. So Nico, he came up with the idea like we should, we should build a little bit visualization toolbox for this. So using skills I learned in the game development, basically I hacked together something in C++ where we took every step of the pipeline of the 3D scanner and outputted it to file. So we then could look at it, play back and see 
exactly what happened. So this was kind of a crucial thing for us to be able to debug what was happening and just to understand what was happening. And interestingly enough, like it started off like a debug tool for us developers, like our engineers trying to figure out, okay, how should I improve my algorithm to make, you know, the 3D mesh look more like the input point cloud or input images. But as it grew and matured, we then started using it for observability of 3D scanners out in the world as well to debug what was happening there. And then we also saw people started using it for marketing within the company. Like we tried to use these visualization tools for marketing and so on. So the, the seeds of rerun started already there in many ways, like the, the ideas, even though it was then like four or five more years before we actually started founding the company. And in between then, I went back to the gaming industry a little bit because, again, I like learning new things. And uh, in the meantime, I also really fell in love with Rust, which is, a, I think, an important part of Rerun's DNA. Yeah, we're going to get on to the Rust significance in the episode. I'm curious, I think you mentioned sort of sounds like Rerun you know, is very much an open source project. And it sounds like it started at some point quite before, I guess, where you guys are today. I didn't actually look up the first commit, for example. So yeah, where did that kind of start, I guess? Yeah. So we founded a company officially in 2021, a little over two years ago. And we we basically decided on it, yeah, about end of 2021. So that's when we decided to start a company. It's more like the ideas have been uh, percolating in, in our heads earlier, especially in Nico's head, uh, our CEO. Okay, so I'm sure for a lot of listeners, they still don't really have any idea what rerun is so yeah what is you know rerun at a high level and maybe kind of going into that could you provide like just some kind of examples or just you know describe what is a demo of sort of how rerun could be used to analyze something and i'll just say you know time series data is kind of quite a big component of this but let's kind of i'll stop there and let you explain sure there's several ways of describing what rerun is I like to think of it a little bit as a visual printf debugger. So usually when you have a program and you want to figure out what's going wrong with it, you may attach a classical debugger to step through the code or something, or you add some log statements to try to figure out what happened when and see what's going wrong. But that doesn't really work when you're working with high-level visual data, like images or tensors or point clouds and so on. So say you're building a little vacuum cleaning robot. That's your startup, right? And your robot is happily cleaning your apartment and then suddenly starts like ramming the wall over and over again. So now you have to figure out, okay, what went wrong, right? So what you want to be able to do is see the world through the eyes of this little robot. Uh, You want to see the camera images that it has, assuming it has a camera, see the LiDAR point cloud if it has some sort of 3D LiDAR scanner. You also want to see like, okay, it's it's probably tracking a map of the apartment as it's moving around, some sort of slam, simultaneous location and mapping. And so you want to see like, okay, is it actually where it thinks it is in the apartment? And so using rerun, you can then use our logging SDK, which is very similar to like a text logging SDK, except you actually log high-level things like images or a map or arrows or point clouds. And so you just throw that into your code, a little bit of log lines here and there, and then you can stream that to our viewer and view that live. You can see live what's happening to the robot, but you can also pause and go back, scroll back in time, scroll back and see what led the robot to think that it's actually, you know, it was it was thinking it was in the kitchen when it was in the living room. Why did it make that mistake, right? So you scroll back in time and see that it's looked at, its camera image was actually at this one point catching a glare from the sun, which made the segmentation image that was output of some neural network be all messed up, which then led to, you know, this third algorithm that analyzed the segmentation image to do a mistake and so on. And so that's really one of the core use cases of rerun is like to figure out what this program of yours is doing. And so it's geared towards anything that has 2D spatial, 3D spatial, and a time component to it. So robotics, computer vision, anything with sensors, basically. Yeah, got it. I love the robo vacuum example. I have one and I end up just watching it a lot to see like, how did it make this decision? And it doesn't have a camera on it, right? So, you know, it's not too difficult to understand sort of 
I think I understand what's going on there, but is that it's even an example I brought up in a in another episode with a different company doing slightly different things. So I love that's where you went with that. Yeah. So I mean, just to kind of recap, there is this element of like streaming data. You're visualizing it. There's then the elements of the platform. I believe that are really like what you sort of term building and then extending as well. Could you maybe just speak a little bit to those and then we'll kind of dive a bit deeper after that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So. You can see, yeah, so we're open source and free to use. We're an open core company, so I should say that right away. So if you want to use Rerun right now, you can, at least if you're writing in Python, C++, or Rust, because that's our where we have logging SDKs for. And so right now, there's basically three parts to Rerun, which is the logging SDK, the viewer, and the database. And so the logging API is what I've already told you about. Like Add a few log lines in your code, and that's it. It's then streamed to our viewer, which has an embedded database in it. So the database is a multimodal time series database. And multimodal here just means we support many different types of data, you know, 3D, 2D. In the future, we're going to have audio and basically anything you want to throw at it. And the time series part of it is important part where you can log things and attach it to a timeline or actually multiple timelines. So Usually when you have camera sensors and so on, you have like a clock that measures the time of your capture, sort of capture time. But then you often you do some processing on that and then you log the data. So you have capture time and log time. And maybe you're also interested in like at what camera frame were we at? So you may want to log the camera frame as well. So you want to associate each piece of data with several different timelines. And rerun indexes on all these timelines allow you to scrub on any one of them and you know, out of order ingestion is no problem either. And this is kind of unique to rerun. And so that's why we're building like our own database for this. And then the viewer is, yeah, this, as it sounds, a viewer for viewing your data in your database, either streaming in or from file. And the viewer can either be installed natively or run in the browser. Yeah, so exactly. The browser bit I was going to come on to, you know, if any of the listeners out there, if you just go to rerun.io very quickly, go to some of the demos and suddenly this I was expecting maybe a video or something and actually your browser turns into you know feels like maybe just to sort of analogize it it kind of feels almost like a video editor and then you suddenly realize it's not it's got all these pains with different things going on and this was just super impressive yeah I would love to just learn a little bit more like was that like a nice to have or did you feel that you really had to go that kind of extra mile to make that a browser experience to kind of get the platform across and i'd also just love to hear about the challenges with that specifically yeah yeah well thank you for appreciating that a lot of work went into that and no it's not a nice to have for us it's an integral part of what we're building so we want to build something that's easy to use easy to install easy to share right and that goes throughout our product so like if you use it in python it's pip install and then you're off to go but it also means you want to share some recording with a colleague you don't want to have to tell them you know install this viewer thing right no i just i just want to have one click zero install to view something and so having it in the web i think is, is almost table stakes at this point at the same time we didn't want to build a classic web app built on you know electron to get it on, on native and have all the legacy <laughs> javascript apis and slowness that comes with it so this is kind of why Rust was a perfect choice. But we can get to that later. But having it in the web also means you can embed it anywhere. Anywhere you can have a web view, you can embed the Rerun Viewer. So we have it running in a Jupyter Notebook, for instance, or in Hugging Face Spaces in Radio or in a Notion document, right? And this is only possible because we have a web viewer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I say it was something that just sort of jumped out at me. You don't often have sort of demos that are that. I effectively, I just felt, oh, I, I understand the platform 100% now, which is awesome. So let's get into the Rust part. I would put a disclaimer out there. I don't have a strong understanding of Rust, and I'm sure some of our listeners don't, and I'm sure some of our listeners have a ton of understanding. I am aware of kind of why Rust tends to be reached for, and I'm aware it's got a really kind of passionate community. So I'd love to hear from yourself rust why from the beginning and like what's been the experience with it now yeah so i found rust around 10 years ago 
And pretty soon I realized like this is the future because I come from C++ and C++ is great in many ways. Like it's a huge toolbox, but it's built on pretty shaky grounds. It's built upon C and years and years of, you know, craft that has accumulated. And yeah, it's, it's not super nice anymore, I would say. And on the other hand, you have more modern languages like C Sharp. I mean, C Sharp is 20 years plus old at this point, but it's still a lot more modern than C++. And you know, high-level languages like Python and so on. And they're great in other ways, like they're memory safe. You're not going to get seg faults or security flaws in terms of like use after free and buffer overflows and so on, all the things you get in C and C++. However, they're usually a lot slower and they have a garbage collector, which means you use more memory. And that also means you cannot easily port them to different places like WebAssembly. So Rust comes along and really solves this in a beautiful way. It has the speed of C, but with the safety of something like Java or Python or C Sharp, which is an amazing feat. And it does so without a garbage collector. And it does so via a strong ownership model and a borrow checker that at compile time makes sure that there's no shared mutability. There's no way you can have mutable access to an object while someone else is looking at it. And this is the cause of so many bugs, even in high level languages like C sharp, right? You're given a pointer to some lists and you think like, I own this list now, but it turns out someone else also has a pointer that thing is mutating it while you weren't looking, right? So this is like why when I started using Rust, like, okay, this is going to displace C++ and I've just been waiting for the rest of the world to catch up and it slowly is. And that's just one of the things that I love about Rust. And like, it's also it has amazing build system, you know, cargo build, and it just it builds, right? Compared to C++, where the build system is a horror show, because there is none. There is 10 different ones that are bad in their own way, right? Rust have some types, that is, you know, tagged unions, a concept from, I think, ML, an original, not, not machine learning ML, but <laughs> the programming language ML, which is once you start using some types, it's like, I cannot imagine living without them anytime at this time. And yeah, there's so much good stuff in C++, in Rust. What more? Well, one of the things I really like about it is the story to compile to WebAssembly. So for those who don't know, WebAssembly is a compile target. It's a binary compile target that can run in a browser very fast. So you can compile Rust and other programming languages to Wasm and run Wasm in the browser. And this is how we run a web viewer. Wasm is also great because you can run it somewhere else. You can build plugins in Wasm and have a plugin system that is sandboxed. So this is something we're eyeing to do in the future for plugins in Rerun. And I think Rust is uniquely situated as a good candidate for compiling to WebAssembly because it hasn't got a garbage collector and so on. I know I can talk for hours about Rust. I really, really like it. It's just fun to use as well. It was easy to find people to hire as well because there's a lot of people, I think, jumping ship from C++ and want something new and nice. And I think Rust is it. If you want more, you can read my Why Rust blog post on our website, actually. If you just Google Why Rust, I think it's one of the top top hits. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's always just kind of fascinating me, I would say, you know, more so than say Go, that if something is built in Rust or someone is working in Rust, they really love talking about it. And that can only mean one thing, like they feel that passionately about talking about it you know it's not like if you're working in node you sort of sing from the rooftops i'm working in node no it's it's great that's fantastic but nobody particularly cares unfortunately so i mean is it fair to say that the for example yeah if we just briefly go back to the browser demo is it fair to say that was only kind of realistically possible in let's just say like a a certain time frame because this was in rust and WebAssembly was part of that process yeah yeah, I would say so. There are ways to compiling C and C++ to WebAssembly as well. So it definitely would have been possible to build rerun on C++ as well. I think it would take a lot more time though, like for us to build it, because we'll be using a old language, which doesn't have all the nice new features, right? So I think using Rust is like just a multiplier in productivity. You don't have to care about, you know, mem- use after free. Threading is almost trivial. And you can do threading very easily. And also I've been in my spare time, I've been building a, a GUI for Rust called eGUI, which I started off like a, a hobby project and now it's what we're basing rerun on. And it was built from the start to be this cross-platform portable GUI that is basically you, th- you hand it 
events, mouse events, keyboard events, and it hands back some shapes for you to draw on screen, which means you can put it anywhere. And it looks the same on web as it does on Mac, as it does on Windows and so on. And so because we had that, it was just like, okay, let's just build this thing. And it's so far so good. Nice. So that's where eGUI, I think you said. So where to find that? eGUI.rs, E-G-U-I.rs. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So let's move on from Rust and actually go to, or back to potentially rerun specifically. So the rerun SDK, you know, as you sort of briefly touched on when you're describing the platform, you know, it supports logging, you know, multimodal data like tensors, point clouds, and text. You know, this is a pretty diverse data type. You've touched on your actually, I think, building your own database. But how do you ensure that, you know, these can be sort of efficiently stored, queried, visualized? Like they're quite, as I said, like quite diverse data types in one place. Yeah, they are. So we're building this on top of Apache Arrow, which is a kind of standard serialization format, which has, you know, support for all the atomic types, you know, U32, F32, whatever, and structs and tuples and unions, enums, you know. And so that's like our base layer. We're not reinventing anything there. But on top of that, we then build our own abstractions. So there's one way of expressing a float in Arrow, but there's not a one way of expressing, let's say, a 3D mesh in Arrow. So we're building our own data model on top of Arrow. And this is, yeah, we're building this using an entity component system, which is an interesting idea from the game industry again. So quickly, an entity component system is a way of describing entities, that is, things, as a set of components. So, for instance, a point can have a position component and a color component and a radius component, a label, perhaps, And you can add your own components to them as well. Like I have a confidence component, like how confident I am that there's a point there or a standard deviation component or whatever. You can just throw components onto your entities. And this makes it very modular and very easy to extend. So this is kind of our basis for our data model in rerun. And so we have built in archetypes, which is like collections of components that make sense, like a point archetype is the one I mentioned. But we're building this in such a way that users can add their own archetypes and components and mix and match them the way they want. And yeah, to make this kind of efficient, we have this logging API for Python, Rust, and C++ that we code gen from our definitions of our components. And you know, we generate the code for the arrow serialization and deserialization. And usually that serialization, deserialization is just like a mem copy because that's how arrow is built. It's a columnar format. So it's like built for efficiently putting the same data after each other. So it's like it's not built just for serializing one string, but a thousand strings after each other in a in a efficient way. Was Apache Arrow the kind of the only choice for this, or you know, was that also a decision that had to be made? We could definitely have considered doing something like flat buffers instead. It's likely that we're probably going to start supporting different formats as well, maybe embedded within Arrow. But Arrow is really the standard when it comes to databases like this. So we didn't want to reinvent everything <laughs> and go cut against the grain, right? And, and one of the things that Arrow has is a lot of tooling. For instance, there's the Parquet file format, which is a format for officially storing Arrow data uh, in a fast way, to compressed way, and so on. I don't know if we'll end up uh, using that. Maybe we will, but there are other file formats out there that is also efficient for storing Arrow. And so we don't have to reinvent everything from scratch. Like that's that's the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes makes a lot of sense. And, you know, one of the big kind of use cases here, it's, you know, being able to handle, you know, data semantics like spatial relationships, as again, if, if anyone goes and watches or uses the demo effectively you'll you'll get quite a good sense very fast of of kind of how that looks how does the platform actually sort of understand and process this i think again you you touched on it sort of briefly earlier how does it understand the spatial data and you know are there examples kind of maybe a little bit more kind of real world in the sense like people are actually using this to solve a specific problem effectively that you've observed yeah so We have like this semantic layer on top of Arrow, as I said, these components and so on. And we also in the viewer have the intelligence to like understand these components, right? So 
when it comes to things like the connection between a 2D and 3D, let's go with an example then. We're, we have a, one user called the Biped, and they're building this vest for the visually impaired. So if you're blind and want to like walk around in the world, this vest has cameras on it and then speakers that tells the, the wearer what's around them. So this is a pretty cool product they're building. And so they have depth cameras that look at the world and try to estimate where things are and they have RGB cameras that try to that they need to match that to. So you want to be able to create like a 3D world and then look back and compare it to the 2D input images and try to figure out how accurate is the 3D world I'm building up around me, right? And so how you would do that in rerun is you would log the transforms for these cameras, they're basically their poses in the 3D world, and you can log their pinhole parameters, like the focal length and so on, the, the, the camera intrinsics, as they're also called. And once you log that, rerun understands like, okay, so this is how I transform from this 2D image to this 3D world. And now you can put them next to each other in the viewer. And if you hover something in the 2D image, you'll see a ray shoot out from the camera in the 3D world. So you can see like, okay, so this, this matches to that, right? And you can see if you have something wrong in your calibration, for instance. Similarly, you can take things in the 3D world, like maybe you add bounding boxes around cars in the 3D world, and you can then project them back into the 2D camera space or spaces, because you may have multiple cameras, and see how well they compare to the, to the images you have. And this just comes for free when using Rerun, which is uh, it's a really cool thing, I think. Yeah, okay, that's super cool. And I mean, performance feels like the thing that must be pretty challenging here, potentially. And it is predominantly open source. So I guess the user is kind of also having to own where it's being run. Can you just speak a bit to kind of like how that's been architected to make performance? Is it a consideration that a user has to think about where they're running it? I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so performance is definitely one of our top priorities like we want something that's easy to use nice to use and that includes being performant no one likes using a slow product so we spend a lot of time making both the logging side fast and the viewer side fast we still have a uh, some ways to go there we kind of early on optimized a lot for for big data like meshes and, and images and so on and in terms of a lot of users just logging also want to log scalars at like thousand scalers a second or hundred thousand scalers a second. So now we're kind of restructuring uh, some of our code a little bit to also handle that use case because we want to be rerun to handle whatever you throw at it at whatever rate, basically. And as a user, hopefully you shouldn't have to think about it too much, right? You just throw data at rerun and we ingest it as, as fast as we can. So like most of the process is done on a separate thread than the logging thread. So don't block that. It's a challenge, but that's also why we wrote it in Rust. And Rust is really fast on its own. It makes it very easy to parallelize things. It's lacingly fast as the meme goes. Nice. But where are the typical user going to be kind of running this? Is this on local machine or is this typically more a container that they, they then push up somewhere and run it that way? I'm curious about that. Yeah. So right now it's running locally on your laptop or whatever if you're a user. We want to make it as easy as possible. So in fact, if you're using right, Python, you pip install, rerun SDK, and then you write in your code, you know, rerun.init spawn, and then rerun viewer just pops up and now you can just log to it. And there's, there's nothing else. There's no, you don't have to start it up separately. You don't have to start any container and so on. We just want to make it as easy as possible. No data leaves your machine, right? But we can also stream data over the network. So you can also run your viewer on one machine and stream the data to, to it from a robot or something like that. And in our future, we want to also then put, make it easy to put your recordings and your data on the cloud. And this is kind of our idea for a future commercial product to make it easy to share data and index data on the cloud. So customization and you know, extensibility, they seem to be a pretty core tenet of rerun. I sort of noticed, for example, like things like, the, I think it's the Blueprint SDK or, or API. Maybe could you just walk through a bit, like how is a, a user going to be extending rerun and like making it work 
for them effectively. Yeah. So our main competitor in rerun is in-house tools. People at companies that work with computer vision and robotics and similar things, almost all of them build in-house tools that are custom for what they're doing. So we talk to like hundreds of companies like this, and they would all like to not have to build it in-house, but it also means whatever tool they use must be flexible enough to cover what they're doing. So customizability and like being able to write plugins and so on for rerun is very core to what we're doing. We're still pretty early in that story, I would say. So we have a, a roadmap for, for doing that better and better. So what we can do right now is log custom data, that is throw any data that can be cover, converted to Arrow, which is any data. And then you can view it in the viewer as, for instance, a table uh, of data. That's not very useful. Often you want to view it as you know, a custom 3D primitive, for instance. Like, and so you would like to add a plugin for the viewer to view your data you know, however you want to view it. And right now, if you want to do that, yeah, you can write a plugin in Rust for a viewer and just you know, compile your own little viewer using this plugin. It's not very ergonomic. We want to do that a lot better. Similarly, we have data loader plugins, which is, let's say you have a file of your own data file of your data format and you want to log it with rerun. You can write a little data loader program that handles files of this file types and logs it to rerun in the rerun format. So that's also like a data loader plugin. We also want to make that a lot more easy to do. And in the end, we also want to make data transformer plugin plugins. So say you log data in, you know, you log some point cloud and you have your know, confidences or different measures on each of these points. And then in the viewer, you want to be able to just like, okay, I want to color the points based on the distance to a camera, but also if they're like the transparency is controlled by our confidence parameter and so on. So you want to be able to write these pretty high level things uh, to transform your data. And we want to have a plugin system for that as well. So our plan there is probably have something that compiles to WebAssembly. So you can write plugins basically in any language at all. And we can even have a, like a plugin marketplace at some point where you can just share plugins with other people. But yeah, this is, I would say right now, all this customizability is more our roadmap than reality. What we do have now is, is the Blueprint API, as you mentioned. And this is our API for setting up the layout of the viewer. So saying like, I want a 2D view on my RGB camera in the top left corner, in the top right corner, I want my RGB depth image. And I want the 3D things projected into that. And down below, I want the 3D space and so on. And that's something we just introduced. And you can control that from, from Python. So you can like set up everything with Python, or you can just drag and drop things in the viewer and then save that blueprint to share with others. Yeah, so, the, so that sort of customizability where rerun becomes more a visualization toolkit, like more and more a tool that you can customize and, and use however fits your company is where we want to head. Kind of leading on from that at the moment, yeah, Rerun you know, is predominantly open source. You know, it seems to have a pretty thriving contributor base when I looked at it. And, you know, not that we should dwell on metrics like this, but, you know, over 5,000 stars, which is not insignificant. So it's clearly got quite a bit of recognition. Did you always know this project would get this kind of a much of attention and like support? Or is has that just actually been more of the catalyst that it's got that support? And that's now why you're kind of looking, you know, for example, to take it in a more in, in a commercial direction. This can really be your life for the next 10 years, for example, or something like that. Yeah. So. Even before starting rerun, before raising money, we talked to over 50 different companies in the field like computer vision, robotics, and so on. And what we heard was the same story over and over again is that they were all building their own in-house visualization tools. And it was taking a lot of time and effort from what they would really wanted to build, because this is not their core strength. This, they don't, don't want to build visualization tools. They want to build robots or you know, scanners or whatever. And so they were building these things and they were not as good as they wanted to be. And they would rather just use an existing tool if one existed. But there, there is none, right? Uh, Rerun is finding a new niche in the marketplace, I would argue. There are similar things. They're doing similar stuff, but not quite as focused as we are. And so we had a very strong 
belief like that yeah this could really be something this people are gonna like this like a lot of companies are gonna like this the open question was like how many companies are there out there that there's going to be used this exactly what do we need to build and so there's been and like how can we actually monetize this and so on how should we build this and it's been a lot of exploration in the last two years just to figure out exactly what we're trying to build right we know what we kind of what kind of use cases we want to build for but it's been a lot of back and forth with design partners like early users to try to figure out exactly what to build but we're really happy with with the uptake and it's really fun to see as well like we have single researchers using it but we are all the way up to like some of the biggest companies in the world using it uh, internally which is just really cool to see it's being used so across the board and in some very unexpected places as well like very early on we had someone come into a discord and share a video of him debugging visualizing starcraft 2 replays with rerun which was not a use case we had in mind but it was really cool to see right so yeah yeah we're really happy i love that example you just gave i think i'm also going through a, a sort of if you want to call it a pmf product market fit journey i guess and yeah i think seeing use cases that you never even thought about actually the fun ones it doesn't mean they are suddenly a uh, you can't say oh the pmf on this specific part it's just more genuinely fun and, and nice to kind of see actually someone using a product in a completely different way than you thought about and it, and it makes sense for them whilst you know you have other users that probably are more towards where you assume it's going to go commercially as you move towards you know a sort of commercial side of the project being developed you know how you know that still sort of has a relationship with the open source side so like how are you approaching that with you know the community with contributors like how are you thinking about the licensing and all of that yeah so it was a pretty early decision on our part to go open core we believe like this is the only path forward for something that needs to be as extensible and customizable as rerun and so we want to make it easy to people to extend the logging SDK and the viewer however they need and want and ideally share their plugins with the world. So we're really happy to like be building this in the open. So, so far, every single line of code we've been written is, is open source and licensed under MIT and Apache. So it's just free to use forever, right? But we also want to build a business. And our idea there is like the the current open source free to use product is geared towards single developers trying to work on their own machine or on their machine and a little robot or something like that and that's already a great experience there's so many people using it like that but then at some point you're gonna realize like you're running out of disk space of recordings because you're recording a lot of data right and then we want to have a very easy way to like okay we'll help you out with that right just upload it to the rerun cloud and then you can easily browse it in the browser and share it with colleagues and like so this is kind of a data platform where we are starting to build pretty soon which where yeah easy to share data easy to find data and yeah if you have your data on your own cloud we will help can build a product to help you index that and, and browse it and so on and again this is so you, you don't have to build it yourself right and we think this is a, a pretty nice split where we don't have to you know make the open source product you know worse in any way right it's as good as it can be for the single person using it on a laptop but as soon as there's more and more data involved or sharing involved where there's like cloud stuff needs to come into the picture basically it becomes a pretty natural transition to have a paid service with us nice yeah that sounds like a pretty solid approach a lot of developers I guess they're the kind of often the one called the evangelist, you know, inside the company that brings the product in. So, you know, they try it out effectively open source and, and they use it so much. And then the company kind of says, oh, wow, what's this tool you're using? And then actually so many of the commercial features are really what's needed to kind of make it possible for the company to kind of keep using it for their commercial purposes as well. So that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, just to kind of, I guess, wrap up, you talked a little bit about kind of where you see rerun but yeah where, where, where do you see it evolving you know over the next few years and um, like are there any other i don't know even just dream capabilities that you're thinking of you know you haven't really mapped out exactly what you're thinking if this is where we can go I, you're excited about that i'm very excited about the field in general i think the robotics field is about to kick off in a big way 
like there's new smaller cheaper sensors coming out drones smaller cheaper robots smaller cheaper and there's more and better you know, software for them as well like there's all these machine learning things coming around right and so i think we're very excited to be like part of this whole ecosystem and what we really want to do is just make rerun like a little oil that makes the whole machinery run nicer right so make tool that just gets out of your way and just gives you the power and and use of it as possible so to that end yeah we want full customizability and plugins that you can just run we want to be able to easily put your data on the cloud and browse it in a browser and at some point like if the data volumes are big we should render it render the whole viewer on the cloud and then pixel stream it to your browser which means you have you know basically infinite strong computers doing the rendering of, for you and it's just streamed to perhaps your phone right so you're not limited by the device in terms of visualization capabilities and so i, I envisioned rerun becoming like a data platform where you can record and share data live with with very low latency and browse and find old recordings and then have those part of your development pipeline your debugging pipeline your observability pipeline your training pipeline for your neural networks you can pull in the data and you know train your neural networks and compare it to some output i see this as like a rerun is well positioned to be like a very core part of this this emerging field very excited about that and beyond that i mean just like more of the same right it's more more support for audio you know support for better video encoding support for more languages right so I think we have many years of uh, <laughs> plans ahead of us that we want to work on now. You've, you've seen this space kind of build up and now you are able to be right kind of in the middle of it because you're building the tools that enable all these things to happen. That's really exciting. So very happy for you guys on that one. And to bring it back around, I can't wait until my RoboVacuum, or rather I'm going to buy a new one at some point that is cameras everywhere and really understands my apartment doesn't just bash into the same chair five times so well for that specific use case i'm really excited and i know there's much more important use cases as well but that's very exciting so just to kind of recap where is the best place for a developer you know get up and running get started with rerun yeah just go to rerun.io as our web page and you have all the instructions there for you know if you're using python it's pip install rerun dash sdk if you're using c++ it's a couple of lines of cmake that you throw in there and it's you're up and running and if you're using rust it's cargo install rerun cli but yeah go to our webpage rerun.io awesome try it out yourself it's as you said there's a viewer there so rerun.io slash viewer and you can play it around in the browser and try it out and i encourage you like if you're doing any sort of thing that has 2d or 3d or time component to it try it out yeah well I think that's a great place to leave it. Emil, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate you giving the time. It's just such an exciting project and where you guys are in your journey. So I hope we get to catch up again on this in, in the future and, and see where you're at. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was a lot of fun.